evening, everybody. I'll give everybody a minute to get settled and just kind of get ready to continue to worship and just welcome the Lord into our heart. So we have a few announcements this morning, um, and we also have um, a couple of special people that will be talking, um, and you'll see them um, here in just a little bit. So right now, we, um, the altar is open. Anyone is welcome to come down and praise God, um, give him your burdens, whatever it is. Um, God is always ready and willing to listen. If you cannot come down to the altar and do the kneeling or anything like that, stay in your chairs, and that's okay too. Um, God just wants us. He just wants us to come to him. Um, and speaking of that, um, as uh, Debbie and Pastor Sean was talking about last Sunday, that um, we have prayer request cards, and we are getting a lot of those in, so we just continue um, to just pray for you. Our prayer team does. Pastor Sean does on his own. And so we just invite you to um, continue to give us your prayer request. Also, too, we have the contact sheet. January is coming up very quickly. <laughs> and so we will be updating the directory. And so if you have not, um, if you do have updated information that you need me to put in, just fill in one of these and I will get them. So, okay. And then the next thing is we do have the pink flyer that is out there next to the bulletin. And um, we have lots of things going on uh, this Christmas. So we have the gift giving tree, which we talked about last week. And there are still cards available that you guys can grab on the tree. Uh, the last collection of those is December 25th. And bring the gifts unwrapped. All the details are in this flyer. Next Sunday, December 11th, because um, today we'll start Advent, next Sunday we're going to start the Advent offering for Agape. And those are, uh, what we're doing with that is we are raising money for goats. And goats help huge, huge in, uh, families in India, in these villages. It helps support families. It helps feed the families and so on. And again, there's more details here. You're more than welcome to come and talk to me if you want to know more, but we will be starting that next Sunday. And then the last thing is we have our invitations for our candlelight Christmas Eve service that we do every year. The inv invitations are out there on an another table. We're going to do things a little different this year, and so we are very excited. We will still have our candlelight service. We will still do our gathering together and singing uh, Silent Night. However, we have some um, fun things in between. We will be uh, serving coffee, hot chocolate, and cookies starting at 5.30 in the foyer on Christmas Eve, and then we'll transition into our service. So we are very excited about that. Um, so yeah, so take as many as you want. Invite family, invite friends, invite your neighbors, um, just to come and enjoy Christmas Eve all together as we celebrate the birth of our Savior. I will go ahead and pray, and then um, while the Packnet family can go ahead and come on up, and um, they will start us off on our first Advent, which is hope. And let's go ahead and pray. Oh, dear Heavenly Father, we just thank you. Thank you for the gift that you have given us, the gift of love. And Lord, we feel that love. And today we just um, pray over Diane as she delivers the message, Lord Jesus. And oh, we just, we just love you and we just want you in our hearts. In your son's name, amen. Good morning, church family. <clears throat> We're going to start off our Advent with hope, with Genesis 1, verses 2, 3. Now the earth <clears throat> was formless and empty. 
Darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. And God said, let there be light. And there was light. At the beginning, there was so much hope into this hope-filled world. God brought the first man and wooden, woman, Adam and Eve. They knew God and walked with him in the garden. But a serp serpent prowled in the darkness. The great tempter introduced fear and mistrust into paradise. He told Adam and Eve that God did not have their best at heart. They accepted what he said and placed their hope in themselves instead of God. At that moment, it seemed all hope was lost, yet as Adam and Eve and all of humanity tasted sin for the first time, God offered hope. God cursed the serpent and condemned him to the dust. Then God promised that one of God, or promised one of Adam and Eve's descendants would come and redeem the beautiful world that they had lost. God said this to the serpent, and I will put enmity between you and man and woman and between your offspring and hers. He will crush your head and you will strike his heel. So now as we light the candle of hope, we remember how God gave us hope when all seemed lost in the garden. This hope is now fulfilled in Jesus Christ. At Christmas, we celebrate the arrival of the baby born to crush the serpent's head. At the cross, Jesus provided hope for <clears throat> any who turn them for themselves and to God. Jesus tasted the sting of death, but rose in victory over sin and death. He now offers the hope of eternal life for any who believe in his name. Jesus is the hope and worth celebrating Christmas. Emmanuel means that God came down from heaven to tabernacle with us, to be with us, to live among us. Before Jesus came, the nation of Israel would cry out to God. If you read the Old Testament, they cried, Lord, come. They were calling for their Messiah. Some, some languages we, call, we use the word anointed one or Christ, but they were calling for Jesus, and Jesus came. As I sing this song today, O Come, O Come, Emmanuel, I think of people who are still in captive or captivity. But we can rejoice because Jesus has come and he's calling all people to him. There is hope. There is hope for this world. If you are able, would you stand? Those of you that are on live stream, we welcome you. And Holy Spirit, we pray to you right now. Come, Lord, come. Come, Holy Spirit. Oh, come, oh, come, Emmanuel, and ransom captive Israel that mourns in lowly Until the Son of God appears, rejoice, rejoice, Emmanuel shall come to thee, O Israel. Rejoice, rejoice, Emmanuel shall come to thee.
soul led by light of a star sweetly gleaming. Here came the wise men from Orient land. The king of kings lay thus in lowly manger in all
to go ahead and release the children for Children's Church. I'll give them a minute to I'm going right. to interrupt her for a second. I just wanted to ask you um, if you've heard about our Christmas Eve program. You have now, right? Okay. We are going to have an ensemble this year and we're going to do a couple songs and I sent emails to those of you that I know can sing if I don't know you can sing, please join us after service today, and we're going to be rehearsing on Sunday after church, so join us. We'd love to have you. It won't be hard. <laughs> Thank you, Cindy. Well, Eshers, if you want to go ahead and step forward, and after we do the prayer and offering, then um, I will invite um, our first um, speaker up. Let's go ahead and pray. Oh, dear Heavenly Father, Again, we just praise you. We adore, adore your son, Jesus Christ, and the gift that you have given us. And Lord, as we, as people give and do their tithe, Lord, bless them. Bless just the monies that have come in, Lord Jesus. This is all for you. This is all yours. It's not even ours. It is yours. And we are giving of ourselves, Lord Jesus. And we just pray this in your son's holy name. Amen. We are going to have... Am I? Okay. <laughs> um, Diana, if you want to come up. We're going to have Diana from Hope Ranch Ministries come up and speak for about five minutes. They will call evil good and good evil. Hardly a day goes by that I don't hear of more atrocities that are being done against the innocent in this world, our children. What I know, though, is that God is in control, and I know this too, that there are millions of people who love the Lord Jesus Christ, and he wants us to focus on him. Friday night, I had the privilege of sitting in the ER for 12 hours. What I witnessed was beautiful. Oh, it was full of sick people, children crying, kids coughing, and adults in pain. I saw mothers and fathers endlessly rocking their children, feeding them, comforting them. I saw people giving up seats, moving chairs, offering help. I heard no angry words, no arguments. 
and I saw a woman giving up her coveted seat by the fireplace so that a young family with a baby who came in could sit there. I saw sons and daughters looking after, adult sons and daughters looking after their parents, clearly worried. Several times a homeless person came in. Security didn't rush over and says, you know, get out. We don't want you here. It almost seemed like they took the time to let them warm their cold bodies. And I was close, and so I heard what a security guard said to one of the homeless. They simply said, we're here to help you check out. And he quietly got up and left. I was encouraged. And I'm encouraged by you as a kind congregation. I don't believe you really are aware of how much you have done for Hope Ranch. We have a room here where we can store things. You have hosted events for us. You've allowed me to speak. Many of you have helped in our yard. Stacy was a great help while she was working with us, and you supported her financially. Lois has helped with newsletters, and I need her again. Various member here have also supported us financially. Leslie is a great encouragement to me, often poking me when I need a good poke and used her God-given talents to raise some money for Hope Branch. I appreciate your new pastors and I appreciate their continued involvement in the community as you people are. Some of our survivors got a Thanksgiving box and one of the young women who her and her family received one is with me here today and I know she would love to talk to you. You've been so gracious in welcoming her. In the past, you have collected Christmas gifts for our bags, and you have no idea how much these mean to the girls. Let me just quote a, do a couple of quotes. Here I sit, said one young lady, eating my favorite Christmas candy, using the best hairbrush ever, tears running down my face, and I'm happy. Another woman called me the day she received her box, and she said, you're not going to believe this. Two days ago, we had found a program for her out east, and that's where she was. She said, two days ago, God told me to get, buy a suitcase for one of the women who was moving on. And she said, I kind of argued because I didn't really have the money to spare, but I said, okay. She said, this, I'm crying because this morning, when I received your gift box, in it was a receipt for the, or not a receipt, but a gift card for the very store that I had decided to go buy the suitcase at. And it was enough to purchase a suitcase. This year, you were once again collecting items for our box, and we're deeply grateful. As I said, it means a lot to the young women, and we have a few men around too. Twice in my life, I have faced death, and one very recently. And we are all here. I am here because God is in control and because we will not go a minute sooner than when he's ready for us. But every time I ask, both times I've just asked God, like, what else can we do? What can I do? What, sh what should I do? And each time he assures me that right now Hope Branch's job, besides looking for those moment, the future when we will have that ranch, that building relationships and building lifelong friendships and supporting survivors is what we are here for. In 2012, I met a skin and bones 15-year-old girl who was being trafficked here on the streets of Eugene. She was certain God had forsaken her. She, um, she then actually was taken off the streets and lived with me for two years. And you know where that young woman is today? Ten years later, she works at the Eugene Mission with women just like her. And that has one, been one of the biggest blessings of my life, to see these women s slowly growing up, growing in God, and becoming really important citizens. Not that they were important before, don't get me wrong, but important citizens are a community. God is faithful, and it's such a joy, like I say, watching these women grow up. What you may not realize is that by praying and all the different ways you help, you're part of their stories. You are making a difference. And one day, when your crown is given to you, you may see a little extra jewel in it. 
and you wonder where did that come from? It's maybe a prayer. Maybe you, when you think of us, you pray for us because we desperately need prayer. And I believe that if we each do just some little part, that we can make a huge, humongous difference. Chelsea and I, and probably Leslie too, will be at the back. We have some little things for you, some little hands out. And I just want to thank you for the huge difference you've made in our lives. That is so good. Oh, such a good word. I'm going to do something that Sean does sometimes and say, this is just extra. From, from the worship time, um, the, oh, I, I really love the verse that we sang from O Holy Night, the one that talks about how he, the king of kings, is acquainted with our weakness. He's not a stranger to the things that are hard for us. Um, I, I'll put this here. Um, I, I, I had an, ex and then this idea that the kings, the wise men would come, and instead of their kings, that they would lowly bow. To me, that's, that's humbleness. And oh, I just, I had a picture one time um, in a, a service that I was showing a video of a, another group doing O Holy Night, like a cantata or something, and there were animals and ballet people and just tons of people part of this production about, and they were climaxing with O Holy Night. And I don't know how they did it, but they got everybody at the end. The animals included everybody bowed to a manger. And it was so uh, goosebumping to watch. But I had in my mind's eye, I just felt like the Lord gave me a vision doing that. Everybody's humbly bowing. But then it's as if the king of kings goes down and lifts up their face and says, it's okay, I have you, you're my beloved. It's how he can do it. He can be both king of kings and yet the one that loves us deeper than anyone ever could. So thank you for sharing that verse. It just means the world to me. Okay, so I get to be here today, and I wanted to explain a couple things. Um, one is why Sean is not here. Some of you already know, but it, it's kind of part of our story, too. So um, Sean's in Missoula with one of his best and longest-time friends named Mark. And early in our marriage, when we were newlyweds, Mark and Melanie were also newlyweds, and they lived in Newburgh at the time where we lived, and we just did tons of things together and just bonded as, like, best couple friends. And even though we've not lived near each other for a long time, we stay close. And um, a couple of years ago, or maybe a little less than that, Melanie had a diagnosis with cancer. And uh, I can just tell you, she was so brave and full of Christ. She trusted him completely. But Jesus chose to heal her by bringing her home to heaven. And that was just little, around a month ago. Her memorial service was on our daughter Libby's wedding. So there was no way we could go and be with them. But we decided, prayed about it, and thought, Sean needs to be with Mark. And maybe even this is a, a little bit different um, comfort to Mark than if we'd been there at the memorial. And Sean has had several days. He left on Wednesday, uh, way delayed by snow in Missoula, but he got there really late. And um, they've been having some really great talks and time together, so um, I'm very thankful for that. Um, so that's why I get the privilege of being here to share with you today, and I get to help kick off our Advent series. And I don't know if it's stated anywhere, but Sean told me that the series is called Arrival, and that's because Advent means coming, and another word for coming is arrival. So before we get into it, I was just took this week in many ways to be thinking about arrival, and I thought, um, well, first of all, I'm going to stick with my notes because if I don't, I'm going to get way off. So if you see me looking a lot here, um, I forgot to say, I mean, it's not just any old arrival. Advent is the time we celebrate the coming of Jesus. Um, as Dave said, Emmanuel, God with us, um, his first coming, and then is we also anticipate and celebrate 
his second coming when either he will come to take us home at our death like happened for Melanie or when he comes again to the earth and he sets all things right. So it's, we celebrate that his first arrival and his coming again that we kind of, we live in anticipation for. But as I thought about just the word arrival, I was thinking sometimes, sometimes something that will be arriving will surprise us. And sometimes it's just an amazing, good arrival, surprise. Sometimes it's a hard thing. But I wanted to share with you just a little something of um, a, a surprise when I got to surprise my daughter Libby when she had a shower. Her mother-in-law-to-be gave her a shower, and, and she lives in Los Angeles, and I got to surprise her and go down there. And so this is, this is an example of a happy surprise arrival. Oh, can we, here we go. I don't know if there's any sound, but <laughs> if you heard it, she'd be going, oh, mommy. <laughs> oh, there she goes. <laughs> Makes me cry just looking at it. So that was a happy surprise. Love those. Sometimes life also has situations that arrive that are not, oh, we better stop that. <laughs> that are hard. Um, and not quite there yet, but we'll, be, we'll get there in a minute. Sometimes the arrival surprises us, and it's a hard thing. Um, we all, I know in our congregation, have experienced different tragedies. A tragedy is a surprise arrival that we're not prepared for. Um, around this time of year, a couple friend of ours in Quincy that we were in the church family with were in a car accident and um, their two young sons died. The mom didn't die and it was very hard on her. She had the hope of Jesus that helped her, but that was, and they wouldn't have made it without the Holy Spirit's strength. So sometimes hard things surprise us when they arrive. I was also thinking that sometimes we know something's going to arrive come, the coming of something, we just don't, it comes quicker than we were thinking. And I was thinking, for instance, Melanie, our dear friend, um, it was really just a few, less than a month ago that I had a, a note in my, or a message in my phone that said Melanie had called, and I thought, I, I knew she was in the hospital, and I doubted it was necessarily her, and I thought it might be her daughter. When I got home, I called and it, it was her daughter and she said we've been told she only has a couple days to live and I had a chance to talk with Melanie. They put the phone up and it was very, very meaningful. Um, but that was a time we don't always get to know we have two days to live. <laughs> Melanie knew her, it, we all know we're not going to get out of this life without passing away. But we don't know when. She knew when, and that gave her an opportunity, actually, to talk and say all the most important things. So sometimes something will arrive quicker than we think. But more often, and Sean spoke to this last week, when we're, we wait. We wait for the things that we're hoping for. And um, so that leads me to this idea of longing. The idea of arriving or coming so often in involves the weighty word to me of waiting and longing. I kind of got stuck on longing when I was studying this work so I, this week. So I looked up the definition for longing. It says, a yearning desire, an ardent ache, and it may be associated with a feeling of loss or grief. And I, I sat in that and I had some things that I was longing for with the Lord that I needed to really pour out to him. And it was so good. He really met me. I don't have time to share every piece of it, but it, I, I, and I would talk with you separately if you want to. But I also thought that the Lord would want me to bring this to us. What are you longing for? Here are some possibilities that I felt like the Lord brought to my mind to consider. Perhaps you or I are longing for answers. The hard questions that we might have for the Lord. 
for a steady job to provide for our families. For, we're longing for courage and healing maybe in a hard patch in our marriage or our family. Maybe we're longing to be wanted and we're just, we'd like the lonely ache to go away. Here's one I, I know from some people shared with me, a longing to see a loved one know Jesus the way we do. And one that I've experienced recently is this longing to see a parent or a child or a spouse again who've already gone on to heaven. I'm, I'm wearing a blazer that was my mama's. She passed away five years ago and I miss her. And as I was decorating for Christmas at my house and had things I was taking out, so many of them are from her. So this week I had some missing mama moments um, and there can be this longing like that's actually one of the I don't know how it all works but when I think about going to heaven I think I might get to see my mom again so that's very precious to me but again I, I just encourage you to maybe sit in that question this week what are you longing for and know that we can bring those things to the Lord because he cares about our heart he says that we can give our cares to him because he cares for us. So that's um, something that I've been thinking of and that the longings we hold really clarify that we have an ache for wholeness and a need for hope. So hope is the word that is our first word of Advent. And what's really cool is I didn't know what the reading was. I never saw what... Um, Megan read for us and thank you to their family for sharing that but it's very much along the lines where God was leading me so I love that when that happens okay so I looked up the biblical definition of hope you've probably heard it before but in this in a Bible commentary it said confident expectation and desire for something good in our future so um, hope matters and the Bible puts it this way in Proverbs 13 12 hope deferred makes the heart sick but a longing fulfilled is the tree of life a longing okay so hope is really at the crux of what we long for so what I felt compelled and obviously the writers of the, the readings today where I felt compelled to focus our hope today is the gospel, which actually means the good news. The gospel of Jesus is the hope that we ultimately long for. So recently, Sean and I participated in an, one of the immersed Bible studies that we do here at Living Hope, and we went through Luke and the book of Acts, where we're, we were looking at the, the life and ministry the death and resurrection of Jesus, and then the establishment of the church, those people that would respond to his gospel good news and say, I want to be part of what God's doing. I want to belong to him. And the beginning of that, which we now are part of that same church that, that Jesus established and we read about. So um, while I was in the group that day, one of the times, the Lord had, it was as if just one of the scriptures I read was highlighted on um, Acts 20, 24. And I felt like the Lord was saying, this needs to be my verse for the year. So I'm gonna, read, it might be up there now, but I'm gonna read it to you too. Acts 20, 24. My life is worth nothing to me unless I use it to finish the work assigned me by the Lord Jesus. The work of telling others the good news of the wonderful grace of God. So that day, that evening, when um, I was sharing this with the group we were in, we kept going between the two groups, um, wanting to get to know people, because if you don't know, we've only been here a couple months, <laughs> so still getting to know you all. But that night, um, Alex asked a very good question. He said, do we really believe it's good news? What do you think? But do we really believe and live like the gospel of Jesus is 
such good news that it changes everything. Um, I, I thought maybe remembering why Jesus came, why he arrived, would be compelling that it would be that stirring again that it's such good news. I know I want to believe more than ever that it's the good news because there are hurting people unaware of how precious they are to the Lord and I want people to know that God is for them and he wants them. So in order to fully grasp the, uh, the amazingness of God's love and the hope he has for us displayed in Jesus, I felt like we needed to go back to the beginning of the biblical story. So we're going to go to Genesis, like was read. We're going to go to the front end. But I wanted to say this. Um, have you noticed that Sean is really good at taking a biblical passage and giving the backstory or a synopsis, and he can just do it, like, super easy? And that's really hard for me. But he can cover, then, a lot more scripture that way. And I, I can't, we're not going to be here for hours. I'm not going to read Genesis 1 through 3, which I'd like to because it's so good. And there's so much meat in it, and there's, I would, I thought, you know what, I can encourage people to take time this week. It was the, it must be important from the Lord, because he had it come to us twice in our Advent reading and what he gave me. Read Genesis 1 and 3 and ask him this week to speak to your heart about his love and, and why he came, okay? But that said, I also want to say, I am thankful that God gave us the word. Because when you're getting ready to speak, knowing, okay, everything that I might say, you're going to have to sift through and see if it meets with your spirit. But anything that I read that is just the word, that's from God. <laughs> so I don't have to worry about that part. But I'm also really thankful that that's how God set it up, that he would leave us the word, a Bible, that would be translated and passed down all these generations so that we would have a standard to know him by. So we don't just make him up into what we think. Well, I think God would be like this. I mean, we all would have different ideas. And we still all have a lot of ways we interpret it. There's room for grace in figuring it all out. But at the base of it, there's truth that we all, as what a technical word, orthodox Christians can know. There's some core values about and beliefs of who God and Jesus is because of the scriptures. Okay, so um, I am very thankful for that. So I'm going to give, for Genesis 1, just a synopsis of that chapter, okay? It might not be as good as Sean, but I'm going to give just a couple of thoughts from it. The very beginning one, and I have to tell you, um, I got this from a professor in college years back, a Bible professor, Mr. Dr. Carr. He started the class by saying, and where it was Old Testament, in the beginning, God. And just stopping there, that right there is deep theology and stuff for another sermon because I just want to keep in mind that God has no beginning. In the beginning, God. Um, he always has been. He always will be. And that puts him in another category than us. Again, he's, he's God. He's who we would bow to. He's God. But today I want to highlight the creation story. <sighs> yeah. Believing this is true and however he, all the details of how long days were or whatever, I'm just focusing on this. God created the first man and woman, Adam and Eve, to be the first people of mankind. And we are their offspring. So in essence, we're part of this story too. God says he made them in his image. And one way he made us to be in his image is in the sense that we desire relationship. You know, in psychology, there's uh, the need to belong is like at the core. And that's part of how God made us in his image is we long to be in relationship with him because we have to get this. God desired us. That's why he made man and woman, you and me. Adam and Eve did not ask to be created, and neither did we. We are his idea. He brought us into this world, 
Um, and there's, he also didn't want to have robots, did he? He wanted people that would want him and would love him like he loved us. So that will lead us to chapter two. I'm going to give a bit of a synopsis of two also. And this is where God made a way for, their, for love. He made a way for it to be a loving relationship with his creation, but it would be, oh, so risky. And um, we all know that love requires a choice. We, we don't get the chance to just be, um, we don't get to tell some, I mean, if, if God were just to use his power to say, um, you have to love me, it just wouldn't be love. Love requires a choice. And I think we instinctively know that. So God could have set it up any way he wanted to, but we're going to read just this one verse from Genesis, or two verses from Genesis 2 to hear it from his own words. So it is up there, but I'll, I'll read it here. And I do, when I read it, I've got to put on my glasses. <laughs> my, I even got a bigger print Bible, but I still need my readers. All right. Then the Lord God took the man and placed him in the Garden of Eden to work it and watch over it. And the Lord God commanded the man, you are free to eat from any tree of the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, for on the day you eat from it, you will certainly die. Okay. Well, a few years back, I had kind of an aha moment with that one when God says that... Um, the consequence, you know, you, you can think of a lot of things that happened in the fall, which we're going to talk about. Like the first sin, and there was consequences. But the main consequence that we just read was, if you eat of it, you will die. And I remember having a friend, a person say, they were very, they were bringing their, the longing of their unanswered questions to God, and I got to be part of listening they were like, why is God so into death? Why does he have to kill people to kill his son even? That's terrible. And I remember being like, oh, Lord, please give me the words, because it was a valid question, really. But when I read this, I, I remember thinking, this is, I wish I would thought of it at the time when I was talking with that friend. But God said, I mean, he knew that the knowledge of good and evil would kill us. He knew it would be death. The thing is, um, in the New Testament, 1 Peter 3, uh, the Lord instructed Peter to write it out for us so we would know that God had had a plan since the foundation of the world, from the very beginning, that, that he would be the lamb that would come and be the sacrifice for us. But that's, that's further on in the story. Okay, so... so God said he had to make a choice, and he said, don't eat of this tree of the knowledge of good and evil. So now we are going to read a chunk, okay? Uh, we're going to read uh, Genesis 3, 1 through 15, I think is how long it goes. Um, but I do want to say one thing. We all probably know this, but I always like to know where it's found. So it's going to open up with the serpent tempting Adam and Eve. And I mean, I remember having children's Bible and seeing pictures of that and it being very like, what? So is a snake Satan and, oh, you know, getting it confused. But in the very end of the Bible in Revelation, it says it twice, but one of the verses, 12, 9, states it for certain that we can know. The Bible speaks to that and says that ancient serpent was Satan or the devil who, as um, John in Revelation says, who leads the whole world astray. So when it, we can know that serpent isn't just some weird snake, it was Satan. Okay, so now we're going to read a chunk. Here we go. Now, the serpent was the most cunning of all the wild animals that the Lord had made. He said to the woman, Did God really say you can't eat from any tree in the garden? The woman said to the serpent, We may eat fruit from the trees in the garden but about the fruit on the tree in the of the tree in the middle of the garden god said you must not eat it 
or touch it, or you will die. No, you will not die, the serpent said to the woman. In fact, God knows that when you eat it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. The woman saw that the tree was good for food, delightful to look at, and that it was desirable for obtaining wisdom. So she took some of the fruit and ate it, and also gave some to her husband, who was with her, and he ate it. Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they knew they were naked. So they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. Then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden at the time of the evening breeze, and they hid from the Lord among the trees of the garden. So the Lord God called out to the man and said to him, Where are you? And he said, I heard you in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid. Then he asked, Who told you that you were naked? Did you eat from the tree that I commanded you not to eat from? The man replied, The woman you gave to me, she gave me some fruit from the tree and I ate. So the Lord God asked the woman, What is this you have done? And the woman said, The serpent deceived me and I ate. So the Lord God said to the serpent, Because you have done this, you are cursed more than any of the livestock and more than any wild animal. You will move on your belly and eat dust all the days of your life. I will put hostility between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring. He will strike your head and you will strike his heel. But I really liked how the version that was in our reading was. He will crush your head. The one coming will crush your head, but you will bruise his heel. Okay, I might read one more there, so I'm going to put that there. All right, so um, if this were an immersed Bible study, I would be saying, what stood out to you? And I, again, I would encourage you to take a time to maybe read this this week. But um, since this is a sermon, and I prayed a lot about what the Lord might want to say, I thought, okay, I need to share some thoughts that the Lord gave me and hopefully connect Adam and Eve's story to our story and then pull it back to the hope that we're talking about in the gospel of Jesus coming. Okay, so what we just read, I, I, I got this. From the beginning temptation until now, we are tempted to bring our longings, really. In their case, it was longings for pleasure and for wisdom to something else other than God. Really, the bottom line is we're tempted to doubt God's goodness and to wonder if God is holding out on us. And th that's one that it's when the Lord shines that on my heart sometimes that I realize I'm still fall getting caught in that. Like, what do I think? I'm the stepchild and God's just holding out on me. That's something sometimes that he'll, he'll help me to understand that that's part of the original temptation is that we would doubt his goodness and to think maybe God's holding out on us. Another thought is to remember again that God had said the consequence was death. Um, and it is true that it's the first sin, sin being that we missed the mark of what God was asking us to do in, in believing he was good. Um, they didn't die immediately. We know that. I also had another person say, I never believed the creation story because he said they would die and they didn't die. But what did happen is the world started to die and their relationship with him started to die. And... Um, everything, if we kept reading in chapter 3, everything from their labor to childbirth became hard. The hardness that we all experienced came into the world. So their choice, and we inherited it, and we know we follow into that, forever tainted our human nature, passing on this bent to distrust God and for every one of us to choose sin at times in our life. I couldn't pass over this, though. 
Another thought to consider is how Adam and Eve, you probably caught this too, immediately experienced shame. They realized how naked they were before God, and instead of it drawing them to God, they felt compelled to hide. Man, shame is super powerful. I've, I've heard it saying that like the Holy Spirit's conviction and will draw us to him to want to confess and be repentant and, and bring our guilt to him. It's like guilt says before God, I did wrong, and we, we want to bring that to him. Shame makes us think we are wrong, like who we are in our core is wrong, and that's what Satan, it's the result of knowing the difference between good and evil, it brought shame and what did they choose to do but hide? They, they, they had to hide from him. And God's question was so poignant to me as I was praying this week. He knew, he said, where are you? And he knew where they were physically. I think he asked them so that they would understand they chose to move away from that close experience of walking with him in the cool of the evening that they'd had with him. Um, which actually leads to the hardest consequence that chapter 3 ends with is that then they had to be separated from God. That's when they had to be pushed, taken out of the garden and that relationship that they'd experienced changed forever. And to this day, all the sin and brokenness in the world and in us has caused a separation between us and the one that created us. But if you remember... <laughs> He created us because he loved us. He, he, wanted, he wanted us. And so he never stopped loving us. Can, can a parent stop loving their child? The story of the Bible, I mean, there's so much. I wanted to go into explaining the timeline of prophecies, and it's like, no, we don't have time for that. You, you study that. Or maybe Sean will bring some up in other sermons. But the story of the Bible went on, and always this stirring in, the people in the stories and in the people that God chose to work through, the Israelites, where he would show himself who he was and later a family that Jesus would come through. There was always this yearning for God. He left in us a longing for him. Yeah, Psalms 23, 6 says, Surely your goodness and unfailing love will pursue me all the days of my life. He was always after us. I do want to also tell you, though, Two hidden, and I, um, the reading brought it out too, two hidden kind of shadows of hope in the creation story, or in the, where we read in chapter 3. The first prophecy of Jesus coming to deal with death and Satan once and for all was when Satan the serpent was given his consequence that one of Eve's offsprings would crush his head. He might bruise the heel of the one that would come, which we know Jesus was bruised for us, but Jesus crushed Satan and death. And that's Easter. Yeah. <laughs> okay. The second shadow of hope is actually found in verse 21, and I'm just going to read it. I don't have it on this slide, but um, if we would have kept reading in chapter 3. Actually, I typed it here, and it's bigger, so I'll read it here. <laughs> um, he said, the Lord God made garments from animal skins for the man and his wife, and he clothed them. So many Bible scholars point out that this is the first sacrifice in the biblical story. God had to kill an animal in order to make the garment, so in essence, the animal was a sacrifice, a death for death, <clears throat> and also a foreshadowing of the coming prophecies and the eventual fulfillment of Jesus being the sacrifice for all mankind. So throughout the Old Testament, the prophecies just kept stacking up. One would come who would deal with the death curse, that consequence, and reunite mankind with God. Yeah, the gospel is meaningful. It is good news. And when we remember how much we need him, that we're lost without God, that all of us, we're all on the same level. There's none of us that are any higher to God than, than anyone else. I, I've heard
heard it said that at the foot of the cross, we're all at the same level. We all need, we all need Jesus. And that biblical beginning helps get that straight. So um, I love how the good news is we remember how much we're loved, how lost we were without God coming after us, because that is what he did. He is Emmanuel. The hope of Advent is that God always wanted to be close with us. That's why he came. The cross, again, that we would celebrate in a big way at Christmas, but we're going to always, I mean, at Easter, we're always going to talk about it. The cross is really that bridge, the way to closeness with the one who longs for us more than we even long for him. Because on the cross, Jesus took on death for all who would accept his sacrifice. He reversed the curse yeah, and proved he's God and he proved how much he loved us. What he asks of all of his beloved human creation is what he did in the garden is that we would choose him, that we would choose to believe he is enough. Nothing else will complete our lives or make us have peace or have hope. It's Jesus. Not Jesus plus this, but just Jesus. And I was praying on the drive over here, Lord, is there any snapshot you want me to add of a life experience that would bring a point home? And I, I, was, I thought he gave me something. So in, I believe it was either 2005 or 2006. I, we couldn't remember for sure. But Sean and I actually, when we were pastoring in Newburgh, came here for a Valentine's banquet or dinner and got to share on to some of you were probably there. <laughs> um, Jason Roberts is the one that asked us to come. We were remembering that. But anyway, that we were speaking out of a season, a hard patch that the Lord had taken us through. And I can just tell you that one of the things that God used in a hard thing for us is that I came to a place of really knowing, knowing in my knower that I couldn't look to even a wonderful husband, as, as amazing as he was, he had his, his faults, but he's wonderful, is that I, he could never meet the longing that I have in my heart to be known, to really be known and, and delighted in. And so I learned through a harder time that God wanted me to know. Not, he also wanted to do some healing in, in our marriage, but he used that time to just solidify that Jesus is my everything. There is no man, no friend, no child, no husband, no anything. It's just Jesus. He's enough. Yeah. Okay. So I wanted to read... Um, Hebrews 11.6 says, Without faith, it is impossible to please God. For anyone who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is the rewarder of those who seek him. And what I've really come to understand day by day is he is the reward. It's not just getting a chance to go to heaven when we die. I mean, that's amazing. It gives hope, the hope beyond this life. But... He is our reward for our now. Because we all carry things in our now that are those longings that we're longing to see movement in or answers to. He is the reward for being with us because he gives us his Holy Spirit. Before, after he did, went to the cross, conquered the grave, before he went to heaven, he gave us the Holy Spirit to say, I'm going to be Emmanuel in you all the time now. That his spirit, the Holy Spirit lives in us and is that reward for saying, I choose you. I'm so thankful for that. I need the Holy Spirit every day just for making it. And he does care. He, he cares. I, I had recently had a dear one say, is it, I, mean, I know I'm saved, but does he care about the stuff that's so hard that we're going through? And it's like that, yes. He does. His reward to us is that he will be with us. In fact, 
um, I felt strongly that I was supposed to read something that I'll just read here in a moment as if it was God saying it. And I don't know if it's for anybody here, and maybe it's a portion of it will meet with you, and you can, or you think of somebody that you would be praying it for, but I felt like the Lord would say this to us. Keep seeking me. Lean into me with your questions. Observe honestly your life and see how I have been at work, even when you haven't recognized it was me. And my promise is this. I will never leave you or abandon you. For all of us, no matter if we have found our hope in the gospel of Jesus years ago or last week or we're still considering if he's even real, my prayer is that we can catch a glimpse of the hope, glimpse of the hope and joy of a longing fulfilled. Remember it, that hope deferred makes our hearts sick, but a longing fulfilled is just a joy to our, is a tree of life, a joy to our heart. And the, the longing that most of us maybe don't even know that we need is to know we are wanted and we were made on purpose and for a purpose. And our pur- purpose is to choose the Lord every day. Stay close to him. Obey and trust that what he asks us to do is good. And live in such a way that people, cherished ones that need him, are drawn closer to believing and choosing him too because they would see Jesus in us. I was thinking, you guys are already doing this so wonderfully. I had Julie at one of our immerse, or maybe it was on a Sunday, Julie gave me a bookmark where she makes bookmarks and puts verses on the back and gives them to people as she is ministering. Leslie talked with me about gathering blankets for the homeless. I know we have a history of reaching out in our community, and that is so on our hearts. We're so happy and tickled to join with you on that. But I also think I felt this before we started because you know we were here for a few months. Over and over in prayer, I just want, felt like the Lord was saying, tell them in ways that you get a chance to, you have an influence in people's lives that need Jesus. And a big part of that is listening to their stories, caring about them, non-judgment, just being someone that listens and gives value to them and loving them, finding out if there's something we might, you might be able to do that would bless them. And I think that God in these days is using that kind of love to open people's hearts to him. Then we get a chance to say about Jesus, I want to share the gospel, good news. But first, I think what he asks us to do is love. So, and I know you're all doing that too. Okay, so I would like to pray for us as we close. I'm sorry I went over. It was hard to, Sean said, remember, did not talk so long. Because <laughs> there were other pieces to it. He really likes to try to stay on, on schedule. So, <sighs> Lord, thank you for meeting with us today. Thank you for the way you um, wove together the hope reading and what you gave me this week, Lord, it just makes my heart warm to you, this hug from you, that you had this in mind, that we get it, that we know it is good news. It was good news for us, and we want to just be on awareness to be used by you, to use the influence we have, to love the way you did, to want others, to care for them in tangible ways, and hopes that, too, we would be able to bring people closer to believing that you're real and that your love is true. In Jesus' precious name, amen. I'm going to invite you to stand if you're able to. Just as Stacy said this at the beginning of the service, these altars are always open. So if you feel led to come down and pray, you're welcome to do that.
Those of you that are listening on the live stream, we just want to let you know that we love you. We're so glad that you chose to worship with us today. Let's sing about the heart of worship. When the music fades and all is stripped away and I simply come longing just to bring something that's of worth that will bless your heart i'll bring you more than a song or a song in itself it's not what you have required you search much deeper within through the way things appear you're looking into my heart I'm coming back to the heart of worship and it's all about you it's all about you Jesus I'm sorry Lord for the thing I've made it when it's all about you all about you Jesus King of endless words no one could express how much you deserve though I'm weak and poor all I have is yours every single breath much deeper within through the way things appear you're looking into my heart i'm coming back to the heart of worship and it's all about you all about you jesus i'm sorry lord for the thing i've made it's all about you, all about you, Jesus. I'm coming back to the heart of worship, and it's all about you, all about you, Jesus. I'm sorry, Lord, for the thing I've made it, when it's all about you all about you oh when it's all about you it's all about you jesus all about you oh jesus all about you it's all about you jesus lord we just pray that your anointing will walk out of here with us today and we pray that your anointing will be with us as we read the first couple chapters of Genesis. Lord, speak to us. Reveal your heart to us. And just cup our faces in your hands. And let us see the loving eyes of our Savior, who humbles himself before us. The great and mighty King loves us. Oh, it's all about you, all about you, oh, it's all about you, all about you, Jesus. Have a great week in the Lord. You're dismissed. Thank you.